Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brad Rathgeber, the head of school of One Schoolhouse, and I am joined today by Lori Palco. Hi, Lori. Hi, Brad. Hi, everyone. Lori is a veteran of independent schools and now has her own practice that uh, focuses on executive coaching. And as part of that work in executive coaching, Lori, you do a lot of work with schools and school leaders around change management. Um, can you give folks just a quick background into some of that work that you do so that they can understand the perspective that you come to this conversation with? Yeah, sh sure, Brad. It's, it's great to be with everyone. And wow, everyone is going through change, both personally and professionally, in so many different ways. And um, I came across a uh, model about 15 years ago called the change cycle that I just really, it just really resonated with me because it focused on the human dynamics of change more than the implementation plans and the outcomes and everything that we need to to make happen and schools are all about relationships so i just found this really resonated for me and for school leaders in terms of how they help employees and themselves navigate periods of significant change and we know we're going through that right now yeah, Laura, I was just about to say, so people are going through a lot of change right now, personally and professionally. Um, when you talk about, uh, when you talk about a, a cycle to that change, can you talk about generally how people process change? Sure. You know, right now, as you said, Brad, everyone is going through multiple changes. And we also process change multidimensionally in terms of the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors we have around change. So let's, let's look at what happened in the spring. There were facts about change that needed to happen, right? There were facts that we were facing, but that brought up so many issues internally and externally for how employees and the school community needed to deal with the change. And it's those issues that drive the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So what we have found is that when we're introduced to change, big or small, um, labeled good or bad, we tend to go through a sorting and generalizing and assimilation process of information to be able to move through those changes. So there are six predictable stages of change that we go through. And those experiences are first one of loss, then one of doubt, discomfort, and hopefully eventually discovery, understanding, and integration. And again, it doesn't matter how the change occurred, we go through that process first uh, one of loss. Do you want me to talk a little bit about loss and fear? Yeah, it, it maybe even in this context right now and, and how, uh, I know Lori, something that you said to me and you just mentioned it, but I almost want to put a, an exclamation point on that is that people go through these stages at different paces too. Sure. Um, you know, for some people coming home and, and working from home this spring was not as big a change as to, to others that were dealing with small children or um, other situations at home. So for some people, that change was not a big change. And for others, the intensity of that change may have been very different. And I, also, I often say we don't need to make people wrong wherever they are in the change cycle or to the degree that they move through the change, right? So what I would say, Brad, is in terms of, um, first of all, about loss, is that we all enter the stage one from a sense of loss. And what that loss is, is a loss of control. And we all like to be in control of, of our environment and our situation and, and what we're doing. But when, when change is introduced, we have a sense of loss of control because things aren't the way they used to be. And for some of us, that's more comfortable than, than others in terms of, of giving up a, a sense of control. What we like to do when working with, with school leaders and with executives is first of all, for them to understand and have a sense of their own triggers and their own fears about what is what is going on and you know how do they move from a sense of loss to safety and how do they move from a sense of doubt to reality 
And I think if you think about the three months we had this spring in terms of the end of our school year, schools moved from a place of, of loss to, to creating safety, to then from a place of doubt to reality that, okay, this, there's a level of acceptance that this is the way it's going to be. Um, and then into a place of, of discomfort in terms of, okay, we got through the spring, but now what does this mean? So one of the things I, I like to do is ask a lot of questions. And I would um, say that as you're moving through change yourself first, and you wanna gain a greater level of self-awareness for yourself as a leader. And I would ask some questions, what is, the real fear that I am feeling? What is, and what is an imagined fear that I'm creating? What is some story I may be telling myself versus the reality of the situation we're dealing with? So I'd like to ask some of those questions, Brad, so we can gain a sense of perspective about really what we need to, to move through and what we're dealing with. And then that really helps in terms of, of how we communicate with others. One thing I have found um, in working with schools where faculty and, and staff and leaders sometimes live is in stage three, that discomfort stage. Um, and that's characterized by being overwhelmed sometimes, okay? And I could see very easily where with everything that we just went through and all the uncertainty going into the fall and all the work that needs to be done to respond to that uncertainty that we could definitely be in a place of overwhelm. So one of the things I would say for everyone individually and in working with faculty and staff is that when, when you sense someone is in an overwhelmed state, be probably more directive then and give more direction than you normally would because I think sometimes people need some boundaries in terms of what needs to be done to to move through and to take that next right action and when we're in overwhelm sometimes we can't see that and our productive our behavior is pretty unproductive so at some point we need to move away from overwhelm and I would I say this sometimes and it's not popular but sometimes staying in an overwhelmed state is a choice that we're making. Because sometimes we want to stay in that because we're, we're not ready to move forward. So as leaders, um, and we can talk about communication, but as leaders, sometimes we really need to be more prescriptive than we normally would tend to be. And what I would also say is don't, don't, um, back off or back away from um, having conversations when you are sensing that people are being resistant or there is a lot of anxiety or unproductive behavior. Lean right into those conversations because they need, faculty need to be heard and they also need direction on what they need to do. And then they can get some motivation going to move toward the change that you need them to make. You know, Lori, I'm, I'm really interested, before I go into this comment, actually, reminder folks, if you have a question, please type it into the q and I want to get to your questions after I ask this next one. So feel free to please type in your questions to the Q&A. Lori, I'm really interested. Uh, I, what I want to do is talk about how we communicate with faculty now. Let's move into, into that, especially communicating with faculty at various stages um, of the changes that they're experiencing. I'm interested to hear you say that there is a moment when leadership may need to be a little bit more prescriptive because I think that part of understanding a cycle of change that folks are going through is, uh, is, really, under, is, is really being exceptionally empathetic to that, to that stage of their, of, of their change too. So can you, can you help me first think about you know, communication at different stages, how we could be empathetic with the different stages that our faculty members are going through, and then maybe circle back to this question around prescriptiveness that this moment might, might ask us to consider. Sure. I, I would always say this, but I would say it even more so given the magnitude of the change. 
that everyone is is experiencing right now and over communicate during times of significant change. So um, I know that is more difficult now because we're not physically together as a community, but I think it's really important for leaders to be as transparent and to be as visible during periods of change as they can be. Okay, and what that means is helping employees understand first and foremost the why behind some of the um, decisions, some of the changes that are being anticipated, so people can understand that. But we know that everyone um, is in different stages of the change cycle, and we also know that everyone have, has different communication needs. So as best you can, I would encourage you to answer as many questions around why, as I said before, how, how, how are we gonna do school differently in the fall? You know, what, you know, what are the details? Some people need all the details of the how and the what, and we're also need, going to need to be able to communicate the when. So try to anticipate as many questions around the why, the how, the what, and the when. I would also say, Brad, that I see schools sometimes make the mistake and in, in organizations as a whole to hype the change. And this is where I think it really um, behooves leaders to be empathetic is to don't overhype the change and don't tell people how the change may be good for them in the long run. Mm -hmm. okay. Because, you know, they, again, are dealing with it at levels we don't, we don't know and we may not understand. So part of that whole communication process with with faculty and staff, I would say also, is to really be a good listener. Be present for questions and concerns. And don't, don't be dis defensive. You know, be clear about changes or decisions that are being made and why those changes or decisions are being made. I would say don't hype the change, but be very clear, okay? Um, and I would also say, don't try to fix how people are feeling. Okay, so we can listen and we can be empathetic, but we don't need to, to fix how they're feeling because it's natural how they're feeling. You're probably feeling the same, the same way, even though you're in a role of, of leadership in terms of communicating and working with, with faculty. So, you know, what we want to do, Brad, from in stage one, going from loss to, to safety, is make employees feel safe. And one of the ways to do that is to, to be present to questions, to listen, um, to reassure, um, affirm what they can do, uh, affirm that they um, have what it takes to, to go through this change, um, really be encouraging. Um, in stage two is, is where there's a lot of doubt because there's just so many questions unanswered. And we may be analyzing in our mind, you know, what, um, what, what do I need to know and how do I get information? So I would say to help employees get through this doubt stage into reality is, is where constant communication comes into play. And also I would say, um, don't be afraid to say what you don't know. You, mm -hmm. you don't have all the answers right now. No one does, okay? But, but commit to continuing to provide information as soon as information's available and provide channels and vehicles for um, communication to flow um, to leaders as well. And I know it, it takes a lot of time and I know everyone's coming off a very difficult spring but I would say also in um, trying to help people move from loss to safety and doubt to reality and from discomfort to motivation, have as many one-on-one -on -one conversations as you can, both formally and informally. And I know it's not the same in Zoom as it is in person, um, but I think those one-on-one -on -one conversations will allow people to express again in a safe way what they may be thinking and feeling. So I think it's important to listen again, 
and look for ways that you can provide support and resources to help faculty move through this. I think what you're going to hear is a lot of uncertainty and doubt and discomfort of, I don't know how to do this in this new environment. Okay, so I think how you provide support and resources and listen to those concerns is, is going to be critical. And that's where I come back to being more prescriptive in, in just closing that loop is that, um, I, I mean, I, I know for me sometimes when I don't know where to start and I'm not as productive, I, I need to just take that next right step. So having those boundaries, just like for students, for, for faculty and staff on what needs to be done next and communicating that and in being encouraging with that, I think will help create some momentum around the change. Don't be afraid to be directed. Sometimes we are when there's discomfort, but there's a lot of learning that can occur in discomfort, just like we're, we're dealing with us as a country right now in terms of the discomfort. It's okay, lean into that discomfort, um, but also try to help them get through it and motivated so they can have a greater level of awareness, a greater level of acceptance, and then they can take more conscious and responsible action around the changes. You know, Lori, I, I'm just gonna make one more comment and then we're gonna get right into the question. Some of which you actually have answered in, uh, have answered in here already, so thank you. Um, I think, Lori, you and I have both been in leadership positions in leading organizations that are working from a distance. And we have found that uh, in order to build the type of culture that you want to organizationally, you have to be much more intentional about that build and the leader has to be much more out there in their presence. Uh, I'll give an example of that, of this that I think uh, might resonate with folks. Uh, many schools, many school leaders at independent schools have a general open door policy where they try to keep their doors as open as possible and they're used to people popping in and having the quick conversation and having uh, and, and sharing um, their thoughts and perspectives. We find in the online leadership space that you as the leader have to be much more out there reaching out to folks and not expecting them to be reaching out to you no matter how many times you are communicating that out. Would you say that that's the case and kind of a shift in, in leadership style that takes place when you're managing a team from online? Yeah, no question, Brad, and I would I would even go as far as saying, and, and when I work with leaders, I, I say this, don't put the responsibility back on the faculty and staff to come to you. Okay, so even in the in-person, the in -person, on campus environment, I still think it is the leader's responsibility to really be visible and to initiate those conversations. So hopefully, the fact that we need to be more intentional about that because we're now working distance from a distance that that will carry over when we get back on campus as well. So what hopefully we're learning in terms of what you said, the, the leadership responsibility for communication and reaching out and staying in touch with people falls more on the leader. I would hope that would translate when we go back to school as well because I think it's really important that we, we, I mean, we wanna create a safe space. And I know lots of heads and leaders, you know, have an open door and people will come in, but um, they also may not come in because they're just feeling, you know, at a loss or they're just, they're just struggling a little bit. So heads of school, academic leaders, division heads, department heads, get out there and, and be visible and ask some of those questions on campus and in the online space. Thanks, Lori. So we have a couple of questions around culture shift, really. Um, Sean asks, uh, does compassion then take shape in the listening and in individual conversations that leadership has, even while leadership appears to be providing direction and being more prescriptive? Yeah, I think it's, I think it starts with with the listening, um, you know, leadership has a responsibility to make some decisions and, you know, implement change, as I said, and to get those desired outcomes. Um, but I think it starts with listening in terms of where people are 
So you can respond from a compassionate place and from a very supportive place. So if they know what they need to do in terms of being prescriptive and directive in terms of what needs to be accomplished, but at the same time you're listening and you're offering support and resources to help them, I think that's the best of both worlds. And I think they will know that you care and it's the culture that, that you want to create. So let's, let's go to another question that again, might hit at this in a different way. How do you manage the culture shift to being more directive um, and knowing, uh, know when to shift back to being more collaborative? It's been difficult to navigate. Yeah, I, I can imagine it's been extremely um, difficult because one of the things that, that we pride ourselves on in independent schools and a teacher and I was in the classroom as, as well is, you know, having a voice and having autonomy uh, around certain aspects of, of my teaching and my practice. And so you know, being, being more prescriptive can feel like, you know, you're, you're not honoring the autonomy that the teachers want. So I, I think, again, it goes back to some of the communication and the why behind the communication. This, in, in terms of everything that, that schools had to do and schools are going to have to do to respond in the fall is going to be about, um, student experience, student learning, um, aligning with the mission and the why of, of um, the school and the decisions and you know, what changes are being made. So I would communicate all of that, um, but at the same time, let teachers know that they still have a lot of creative space in the, um, in the online space, if they're doing hybrid learning or distant learning or certainly on campus, that their ability to work with students and to create that teacher-student relationship and um, have their unique footprint in terms of how they, they teach, that is still there in the context of some broader decisions that the school is making around how we're going to do school. So it's, again, trying to communicate. It's, it's not an either or, it's a yes and. Um, yes, um, we're making some of these decisions in the best interest of our students and families. And you as a teacher still have the, the opportunity to be creative in that, in that classroom, in that, in that online space or in your on-campus space. Lori, Joyce asks a great question. Does the change cycle tend to be linear or is it like grief in that one can move back and forth between different stages at different times? That's a great question. In this short, short uh, webinar, I don't have a chance to talk about something that happens between discomfort and discovery. And that's something that we call the, the danger zone. And we, we call it the danger zone because at some point, if you don't move out of that discomfort into a place of discovery, we have what we call the, the one, two, three dance where we'll repeat the cycles. If we can't get out of discomfort into a place of more of discovery of how this change may not be working against me, we tend to repeat the stages. So that's why working through each of the stages is critical because that will help us from not repeating them just like in stages of grief. If we grieve well, we begin to live well. So if we can, if we can go through the change cycle and understand our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and move through them, then we certainly can um, move to a place of discovery and not repeat um, going back into that fearful place. Lori, this is going to be our last question here, um, and it's going to bring you to a particular comfort zone. Uh, so I think you're going to like it. And that is how much transparency about the financial realities uh, that are pushing decision making do you recommend? Yes, we're guided by our students and our mission, 
but we may be asking faculty to take things on because if we don't, the school may not survive. I will answer that from experience to start, Brad. Um, <laughs> you know I have some strong feelings about this. Um, uh, when I left my corporate um, job and, and started at the Atlanta Girls School, I was in the classroom for seven years. And then in 08, 09, when we went through the, uh, the recession that we did, they asked me to become uh, associate head of school. And so I did. And, and one of the things I started with um, was the recognition that we needed to make some, some changes from a financial standpoint because of where the school was. So um, shortly after coming in as the CFO, I, I communicated with the faculty about where we were as a school financially. And, and it meant announcing that some faculty would be laid off. And it meant that it would, um, some faculty would have to take on more. Some faculty would, would not get stipends. I think that we should be as transparent as possible around the strategic and financial issues that drive decisions and change because that way people have the right information and they're, they're not going to make it up, okay? Yeah, you may not share every last detail and you certainly don't want your own fears coming out when you're sharing financial information, okay? But you wanna be as factual and transparent as possible so people have the information to make choices um, about how they're going to adjust to change. Because so remember, they're gonna experience loss and doubt and discomfort. The more we can communicate from a place of transparency, even around financial issues, the more we're going to, under, we're going to help people move through and buy into the changes that we need. Lori, as always with these, we um, try to keep them at a half an hour and so we're gonna do so, but my guess is that uh, some folks may want to hear some more from you. So I'm going to share my screen real fast here uh, and point folks towards um, some on-demand courses that Lori has created with us to help folks with this. If you go to oneschoolhouse.org slash on-demand, scroll down, you'll see Love Money Purpose, the change cycle, managing self through periods of change, managing results, leading employees through change, and communication strategies for leading change. My guess is that these courses may be helpful to folks um, coming out of this conversation. And again, it's just oneschoolhouse.org slash on demand. Lori, thank you so much for sharing your insights with everyone today. Uh, I know that they were um, uh, very uh, timely perhaps for the decisions and conversations that folks have to be having. Thanks thank everyone for joining. Thank you.